Well, we can't really talk about the toxicity of aspirin unless we bring in this whole concept of COX-1 and COX-2. So we have to uh, talk about it. The best way to understand COX-1 and COX-2 inhibition is to realize that aspirin and other uh, NSAIDs inhibit both COX-1 and COX-2. And COX-1 is cyclooxygenase 1 and COX-2 is cyclooxygenase 2. Aspirin inhibits both. Well, that's really nice, especially in the inhibition of cyclooxygenase 2, because in the inhibition in the inhibition of cyclooxygenase 2 or COX-2, that's primarily the uh, decreasing the prostacyclin and uh, the anti-inflammatory effects of aspirin and some of the antipyretic effects as well. The problem is in the inhibition of cyclooxygenase 1 or COX-1, you are looking at the biochemistry of things which will normally affect platelets and gastric mucosa as well. And that's why patients that take aspirin uh, often have coagulation problems because of the uh, thromboxane A2 or the fact that there's a lot of uh, gastric bleeding because of the fact that there's gastroprotective prostaglandins that are being interfered with. So the multi-billion dollar industry that has developed in the last uh, generation or so has been the specific inhibition of cyclooxygenase 2. And that's why you could take aspirin, which is, you know, less than a penny a pill, and all of a sudden charge, you know, a dollar a pill now because of specific COX-2 inhibition. Let's look at the biochemistry chart of this whole thing. You have arachidonic acid here. It is formed by the action of enzymes called phospholipases from the breakdown of cell membranes, okay? Uh, steroids inhibit this process by inhibiting the uh, formation of arachidonic acid by phospholipases. Once you have arachidonic, arachidonic acid, however, you then have your arachidonic acid derivatives. There's basically four groups. There's the leukotrienes and there's the lipoxins. For arachidonic acid to form into leukotrienes and lipoxins, you need the uh, action of the lipoxygenases. For arachidonic acid to form into the prostaglandins, the prostacyclin, and the thromboxanes, you need the cyclooxygenases, in other words, COX-1 and COX-2. So let's go back to our little chart here and say that if you could specifically uh, inhibit COX-2 without inhibiting COX-1, you'll take away most of the uh, bad effects of uh, aspirin, and that's how I look at it. So let's move down now from the personal exposures to the medications to the types of exposures we call indoor air pollution. We won't really talk in detail about too much of this, but you should remember that uh, carbon monoxide can build up indoors. Nitrogen dioxide could build up indoors, not just in industrial settings. Wood smoke, a lot of people still burn wood in their homes. You could have the formation of formaldehyde. I think any pathologist can give you a 10-hour lecture on that. Things like radon, radioactive but inert gases, bioaerosols, tiny little particles that carry a wide variety of pathogens, as well as manufactured mineral fibers. These are all things that contribute to toxicity in the air that we breathe indoors. And let's talk about the one of most significant concern and the one that has the most known and proven effect on lung cancers, and that's radon. It's in the uh, series of atoms on the periodic chart that just love to take up <coughs> the one additional electron. It's the heaviest one. It's radioactive. It's a decay product of uranium. It's widely distributed in the soil. And it's present in a lot of the uh, uh, basements of homes, older homes. Uh, and it's present in the basements because being a heavy gas, it tends to actually sink towards the floor and the lower uh, floors. Uh, the radon decay products are alpha emitters. 
you know, which are two protons, two neutrons. <coughs> and even though they are relatively low energy and low penetration, they do tremendous amounts of uh, tissue damage. And they probably do enough to actually uh, wind up uh, causing mutations in genes, um, which are protective from cancers. So the facts are, the statistics are, uh, about 10% of U.S. homes have levels of radon associated with the increased li uh, risk of lung cancer. And statistically, if you look back, uh, radon causes about 10,000 lung cancers per year. Not nearly as much, perhaps one-tenth or one-twentieth as much as tobacco, but it's a significant amount. So basically, the uh, the general principle is to have proper ventilation. Make sure, you know, uh, there are radar and detectors for houses, but proper ventilation is the best way to um, keep radon from doing its bad effect. Let's talk about lead. Lead is a heavy metal. The body is often fooled into thinking that it's calcium. Uh, in the non-industrial setting, the uh, lead exposure, some lead paint, perhaps lead solder uh, in plumbing. In the older houses, we didn't have PVC. We had lead. Some of the uh, ceramics are lead glazed. And, of course, there's the industrial exposure, which the average person doesn't have to worry about. Lead can be ingested if some of these lead paint chips are ingested. Or they could be inhaled uh, in industrial exposures. It's a divalent cation, like calcium. It's taken up by bones, especially growing bones and teeth. And uh, the body is fooled into thinking that lead is calcium because it's, uh, it reacts much in the same way that it does. Once lead gets into a bone, the turnover rate is extremely slow. So of all the lead that is in our uh, bones right now, we're still going to have half of that in 30 years. Um, blood accumulates in 5 to 10 percent of lead, but lead is rapidly cleared from the blood. Nevertheless, lead has a, a distinct uh, effect on the formation of red blood cells. Most of the lead uh, in our body that's not in the bone or the small muscle in blood is distributed in soft tissues, and eventually it can be extruded from the kidneys. So that's the compartmental analysis of lead. Let's talk about the bad effects of lead. Well, lead biochemically has a high affinity for sulfhydryl groups, and that's going to result in having some of the uh, uh, red blood cell toxic effects of lead, where we see basophilic stippling of erythrocytes and resulting in a hypochromic type of anemia. Lead chemically competes with calcium ions as a divalent cation. And therefore, to can accumulate in bone. It's also involved with uh, neurotoxicity because of the importance of calcium and nerve transmission. And lead inhibits a lot of the membrane-associated enzymes, like 5' prime nucleotidase. And therefore, it's going to result in decreased survival of red cells, and therefore hemolysis as a hemolytic type of anemia, renal damage, and even hypertension. Here's a nice little diagram showing some of the places where we talk about lead doing its effect. You can have uh, lead lines in the gingiva as a observation of the mucosa itself, or you can have lead lines as a radiologic observation near the epiphyses of bones and growing kids. You can have a toxic effect of anemia, of anemia type effect in the blood with red cell stippling. You can have uh, kidney disease, gastrointestinal tract disease, and a lot of uh, central nervous system effects due to the fact that uh, lead uh, behaves like calcium and um, it, interferes with, it interferes with a nerve transmission. Um, let's look at some of these things uh, in the lab and in the patients and in the x-ray lab. And we'll have to uh, do this in the next clip. We'll talk about some of the observable effects of lead toxicity. Thank you very much.